Greetings to all of our members. We're so happy to be with you here today. Uh, it's an auspicious day. Of course, we want to talk about the results of the election. And uh, we are very encouraged by the COVID-19 vaccine information that has come out today and has heartened people across the world uh, about whether we will be able to beat this COVID-19 pandemic. When we think about the results of the election, I think what's really important is that whatever, whoever's in Congress, who, whoever is in the administration, uh, the real estate roundtable is going to be there where public policy is being made. And on behalf of all of our members in the commercial real estate industry, we are going to remain at the policy discussion table, sharing our perspective, offering our ideas in a positive and constructive way so that policymakers can really find ways to grow the economy, create jobs, benefit individuals and households, and the real estate industry. So um, as we think about the election, Jeff and John are really going to talk about the gestalt of where we are, as well as some specific policy positions that we are developing and how we are going to engage with the new Congress. And we're very excited about our policy priorities. And the team is also here to discuss some very specific ideas we have uh, to prioritize with uh, the new administration and with Congress. We're also going to hear from Senator Michael Bennett, Bennett from the state of Colorado. He is a very interesting senator who has always taken a very thoughtful and pragmatic and centrist approach uh, to policy issues. And so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, we, uh, some of our priorities as you think about policy going forward are really going to be the COVID relief package that at some point will come out of Congress, whether in the lame duck session or later. And some of the ideas we have for a renter's fund, uh, for state and local government relief, for PPP and CARES Act funding, and also for continued vaccine and testing uh, advances and distribution. So we're very excited to continue engaging with our members. We hope to uh, sponsor some small group sessions with congressmen and women who have been in office and maybe some who are coming into office. And we want to continue to represent you in our industry uh, as we go through this transition with federal policymakers in Washington. So with that, um, we're really lucky to have an incredible team with, with Jeff uh, and the staff at Real Estate Roundtable. And I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and John Fish uh, to get into some specifics about where things stand. Jeff? Good afternoon, John. Why don't you, uh, I, I guess, first of all, uh, thank you, Deb, and welcome John Fish, our new chair elect. Uh, the board uh, selected John, if you haven't caught up with that information, as our uh, uh, chair to succeed uh, Deb, and we're excited about that. John, how are you this afternoon? What, what have you been doing? What do you think of the election, John? <laughs> Jeff, thank you very much. I want to begin again by thanking you and your staff for doing such a wonderful job on sort of taking analyzing this election process. It's been quite exciting. And Deb, I just want to thank you for all your work. You've been doing a, a wonderful job. We're very, very proud to have you as chairwoman of the Real Estate Roundtable. You know, what's interesting is I think this is one of those points in time where you it's almost best to go slow to go fast. As we think about where this election has turned out, it's almost like we want things to settle down a little bit. I think many in the real estate industry, I think in general senses, almost feel like they have to defend themselves because of some of Trump's policies and some of the behavior and articles that were written in the papers. And to me, I don't think we need to defend ourselves. I think we need to just take a step back, sort of allow the process to unfold in a thoughtful way and be measured about our actions. Because when you take a look at the election results and you look at them and break them down into three different categories, from the president's election, 
You had 140, 140 million voters out there, 143 million. Our president got almost 70 million of those votes. The, excuse me, 70, uh, 74 million of those votes. The president left got 74, I should say. And what really I think Biden is trying to create is a one America at the end of the day. And this is his time to bring both the Democrat and Republican parties together in a thoughtful way. And I think he's going to stay focused on that for the next, I would say, 35 to 60 days. The senator race, you take a look at that. Right now, it looks as though the Republicans are going to gain control of the Senate, maintain control. But we don't know about what the run-up elections are going to happen in Georgia. But at the end of the day, no matter what happens in Georgia, and from my perspective, I think having a Republican there will slow down what the Democrats can do. But at the end of the day, the, the Senate is very, very tight, whether it be 49, 51, 50, 50, whatever the case may be, it's going to be very difficult to move sort of legislation that is not really looked at in a positive way by both parties. Then we move down to the House. And we think about the House. House is left, remaining uh, left over the past four years or so quite a bit. And I think what's going to happen with them losing seats in the House and the Republican gaining seats it's going to cause the House to move much more towards the center. I'm not going to say it's going to be a centrist, but I think we're going to see much more of a practical approach to business coming from the House. That voice is going to be very, very important to us. With respect to the real estate roundtable, we think about our response to what's going to go on. I think as Deb pointed out, there is no doubt in my mind the vaccine is the most important thing. We can't move forward without a vaccine. And I believe the news today was absolutely, I think, outstanding for everybody, not just Americans, but the entire world. And I think the pent up demand and I think the enthusiasm that's coming out of this announcement will really sort of respond in a positive way to our economy and the real estate industry as a whole. Think about what happened to the Dow today, almost up almost 20, 20 uh, I'd say 1,500 to 1,400 points roughly. So you think about our response first to COVID. Second, I think which is important on this COVID bill, we need to understand that cities and towns and states need support. Every one of them, especially the large ones, have been ravaged over the past nine months or so. And if we don't support the cities and towns and states, getting them back on their feet, the issues of layoffs, the issue of slowing back services, the impact on education in the cities and towns is gonna to continue to spiral out of control. And I think if that happens, that is really detrimental to our business overall. Couple with the PPP support, because we need to put people back to work. They need payroll protection and they need the jobs and they need that sense of security. They can buy food and put it on the table. Lastly, what I think we need to be focusing on high level, and Deb, you and I spoke about this yesterday and Jeff, is building relationships with some of the new members of the House and some of the new members of Congress. People like Akeem Jeffries, he's going to play an important role in this new administration. There is no doubt about it, whether he jumps into the speaker's position or he sits on sort of the front bench of the situation. Stephanie Murphy, a person we've been supporting for a long time out of Florida, a Democrat. She's a wonderful human being, blue dog Democrats, understands business and has a strong sense of what it takes to drive successful business. Then on the Senate side, Mark Kelly from Arizona is another person that comes to my mind. A new individual, strong brand, strong reputation, I think in the Senate, he's going to be highly respected, although despite the fact that he's new. Then I think Senator Bill Haggerty, I think, is going to be very, very important. He's out of Tennessee, a Republican. He's got a very strong reputation. I think he's going to come to the table and be very helpful. And then, Bill, if you and I have been discussing overall this whole idea of uh, Senator Corrin, you know, the no problems on his uh, situation, I think that can be helpful to all of us as well. But at the end of the day, I think what's important is we go forward thoughtfully, okay, with our hands together, be united, and not allow ourselves to become fragmented in this new reality that we deal with. And hopefully, at the end of the day, they come up with some infrastructure bill at the end of the day. And that, I think, would be a blessing to all the communities. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Jeff. Well, John, you hit it out of the park. I think that's a very good summary of where we are from a big picture point of view. Let me just maybe underscore a couple of things, and then we'll get into with our policy team some specific uh, sp specific impacts that might uh, we we see anyway from the election for our more narrow issues, uh, and then we'll have Bennett. But first of all, I think that in fact this morning I was asked by someone, 
well, how did the election, uh, what, what election does the impact, the, the election have on, on, on your policy stuff? And I said, basically, whatever you thought you knew was going to be the result two weeks ago, forget it. Because we're now starting from a new base in, in terms of people really, the echo chamber that we all live in and experience had the House increasing its majority not decreasing it. And it will now, it looks like it will have the most narrow majority in modern history. And that will, as you said, John, empower individuals and it will empower caucuses and groups. You mentioned Stephanie Murphy and the Blue Dogs. They'll be increasingly important. Um, Hakeem Jeffries and the Congressional Black Caucus, very, very important. And then the one that I really want to highlight and, and, and thank a lot of roundtable members for supporting, as well as what we've done with the, the No Labels group and the problem, problem solvers, who are really now the middle of, of the House. And those groups can be empowered. It will, that narrow margin, have the impact of uh, keeping some of the more um, uh, you know, fringe ideas or ideas that perhaps don't attract a bipartisan support. We'll keep those on the sidelines. It'll be more up the middle, I believe, legislation. And the same, and by the way, and the House is looking at, these same House members are looking at 2022 already. Don't think that they're not. And they know that historically the party out of power in the midterm election loses on average 37 seats. And so all of that is going to rein in to a certain degree, uh, some policy actions that otherwise I think we all were thought were coming from the House. Over on the Senate, it's the re reverse side. If, if it's Republicans by a vote or two, or if it's 50-50 with Kamala Harris casting the deciding vote, either way, the uh, in this case, the Republican arch conservatives, I think, will be encouraged to move more to the center because they too are looking at 2022 where they have 23 Republican senators up, 10 of whom I believe are up in Biden won states. So all of this affects the big picture of policy making. And it also uh, tells us, well, okay, if there's not gonna be you know, a single party controlling uh, items, then how are a lot of the things that the Biden campaign and uh, vice president ran on going to get done? And I would say that we should pay close attention to the regulatory activities, uh, the executive orders, obviously, that he can do with a uh, stroke of a pen, but the regulatory actions. I think there will be a lot of, uh, of items in these agencies that we need to pay attention to uh, going forward. But that's just how we see it. I mean, we, uh, Deb said it well. We're going to uh, advocate from a position of facts, as we always have. We're going to advocate from a position of coalitions within uh, the real estate industry and without where we can with other industries. And we're going to go up and bring real world implications. We're going to talk about jobs, uh, communities, as we always do. And uh, more so, we're going to talk about opportunities and whether all parts of our uh, uh, citizenry get uh, the ability to participate when things are growing. So let's get right into it and see what our folks think about, uh, about uh, well, let's start with the lame duck, Dwayne Desiderio, who handles principally our uh, sustainability and land use and energy issues and does a fantastic job. And we obviously still have a full agenda on all of those things. But Dwayne, what do you think? A COVID bill in the lame duck uh, or not? And if so, what's it look like and what, what do you think is going to be in it? Well, thank you, Jeff. And uh, good afternoon, RER Nation. Uh, we don't know a lot yet about what's going to happen in the lame duck, but we do know a few things. Um, we know that government funding runs out on December 11th. So there will need to be some kind of funding effort, whether that's a short-term continuing resolution that goes on for a few months into what we're all anticipating will be a Biden-Harris administration, whether somehow or other they craft a longer omnibus budget deal that takes us through uh, uh, the fiscal year that ends on September 30th, yet to be determined. Um, we also know that whatever lingering federal judgeships are out there, uh, that will be a priority in the Senate. Um, and whether or not there's any action on another COVID relief bill at this point is still a big unknown um, that might attach to a CR. It might be a standalone uh, bill and nothing might happen at all. And it might be one of the first efforts and steps of, of a Biden-Harris administration. Um, over the weekend since the election, 
uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has changed his tune a bit. Prior to the election, he was not asking or pushing for any kind of COVID action at all. Um, since last week's election, he has been saying uh, he's open to it. Um, so there could be opportunity to come together um, around uh, some kind of COVID package during the lame duck. Um, of course, President Trump is the wild card still here. Um, he is still the president during the lame duck. He would have to sign and agree to any package that might come together, um, whether or not he wants to clear the decks and, and give a boost to the new administration, should that be confirmed. I guess that's yet to be seen, but we shall see. But in any event, um, there are pieces that are falling into place. Um, some we know about um, and some isn't necessarily news, but if a package does come together, uh, we know that as John had, had intimated, uh, one of the key democratic priorities is going to be funding for state and local governments. Prior to the election, um, the Republicans, primarily Mitch McConnell had said that is off the table. Um, he has indicated that, well, maybe we can do something around the, around the scope of assistance to state and local governments. So that's positive. And at the same point, uh, we know that one of the lines in the sand that uh, the Senate Republicans have drawn for a COVID relief package is liability protections uh, for businesses, for schools, for medical providers. So our, our thinking is that therein lies the seeds for some kind of compromise. If the sides can come together on liability protections, if the sides can come together on the scope of state and government relief, that probably is the nucleus for a larger package that falls out. Um, and there's a lot that could be in that package, um, you know, apart, aside from those things, which would certainly be important for the economy and, and for our industry. Um, other elements that we think are very much in play that had been in play uh, on the residential side, on the multifamily side, would be a dedicated renter assistance fund. Uh, the current federal eviction moratorium that the Trump administration signed through executive order expires at the end of this year. Uh, we are now again starting to see renewed cries in the press for a pending tsunami of evictions. At least that's the message that is now starting to come out in the press again. Um, so very much on the mind of legislators will be extending an eviction moratorium via legislation, but combined with some kind of renter assistance fund. Jeff, you mentioned the Problem Solvers Caucus. Uh, they have put forth their proposal prior to the election that is in the middle in terms of the price tag. If we have the Democrats at one end, and there are 2.2 trillion, and if we have Senate Republicans at the other end, their latest proposal was 500 billion. The Problem Solvers Caucus has something in the middle that is splitting the difference eh, so or so around 1.5 trillion. And so we're looking to see what's in their package that might be able to bring the parties together. And this does include a uh, residential rental assistance moratorium. That package has a $25 billion fund set aside geared to low income families that would be able to tap into it. Uh, perhaps not as high as we would want, but certainly better than nothing at all. So we'll continue to see how that plays out. Um, hey, Brian, um, yes, that, that uh, you know, you mentioned the moratorium, the eviction and so forth. It is worth noting, you know, kind of in a similar vein, some of these state initiatives, uh, particularly the California split roll yep. tax, as well as um, uh, rent control in general, both have failed in the state of California, a, a very strong effort by business and, and real estate interests. Dwayne, maybe we'll come back after Bennett because I want to get through some of this other stuff, but thank you. You've been doing a great job. And, and also we've got these energy issues that we didn't talk about, but we know that EPA and the energy department will obviously continue to focus on tenant star, uh, yeah, energy star, other issues that are very important to us. So let's move on to taxes. I know everybody wants to know if their taxes are going up or down or sideways or what's happening. So uh, Ryan, uh, why don't you give us a quick tour of how you see the tax policy debate changing because of the election last week, if you do at all. Ryan McCormick? Absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so President-elect comes in with a very ambitious tax agenda. It's one he introduced really gradually over time through the primary and general uh, campaigns. It includes raising the capital gains rate to parity with ordinary income repealing the 20% pass-through dedu deduction. And recall, this was the provision that was designed to provide relief to 
um, uh, non-corporate businesses, partnerships, LLCs, similar to the corporate relief in the 2017 bill, uh, repealing the ability to defer gain through like-kind exchanges. So a lot of provisions that would affect real estate. Uh, we, are also op we were also operating with the assumption that we could be confronted by a very serious proposal uh, that's attracted a lot of attention from the um, ranking Democrat on the Senate Finance Committee, Ron Wyden, to create a mark-to-market tax system that would tax capital assets on an annual basis, whether or not they are uh, disposed of or sold. That would obviously have enormous consequences. Um, but the overperformance, really, I think, on re of Republicans uh, on the Republican side in Congress is going to make those more difficult now going into 2021. It's going to be a lot of pushback, I think, on the Republican side to uh, most of those proposals, all of them most likely. Um, but there are things that Republicans want, and those might include uh, things that we care about as well, like liability protections for businesses. So now really the focus shifts to what can be done on a bipartisan basis in the tax area. And really, I think this means um, what can be done at the leadership level in terms of direct kind of negotiations between uh, the Senate leader and um, Vice President Biden, assuming we end up uh, with Republican control uh, of the Senate. I would add too, going into 2021, I think we're gonna see the pressure really increase to start offsetting the cost of legislation. We're gonna come out of 2020 with uh, you know, 4 trillion, three and a half, four trillion of measures that were not offset. I don't think that's uh, gonna be sustainable going forward. For very long, you know, maybe we'll have one more stimulus bill, like Dwayne suggested. But beyond that, uh, I think there will be pressure to start uh, offsetting the cost of some of these big initiatives. I just want to note that every major tax bill over the last 30 years, it's come in the first year of a presidential administration. Sometimes those are tax cuts. Sometimes they're tax increases. Uh, sometimes they involve a divided Congress. So look at um, Bill Clinton in 1997. We had a balanced budget agreement. Uh, that was a divided Congress. We had a very big tax bill uh, of President Obama, 2013. Of course, he was dealing with the fiscal cliff, but we had a very big tax deal in the first uh, year of his second term as well. So um, certainly there's a lot of issues uh, still out there in tax bills. I think they're gonna be you know, probably smaller, um, but there are gonna be bills next year that traditionally include revenue increases, such as the uh, highway bill, most likely we'll get a five-year highway bill next year, and that's likely to include some tax provisions. So very focused on those. And so we're just going to continue you know, kind of preparing for all of these issues as we have been, taking them, uh, of course, very seriously, developing our arguments, developing the data where it doesn't exist. Had a lot of good fortune on that front, with uh, particularly with like-kind exchanges, where uh, prior to the academic research that the Roundtable and our partner organizations at a commission, there wasn't a lot of data out there on like kind exchanges. And so that's been very helpful. Um, Jeff, I could continue uh, on, on some other some smaller tax issues, or maybe you want to. Uh, let's, let's, because I know Senator Bennett's going to join us right at 530. Uh, so I want to move on. But uh, thank you for all of that. And in, in many ways, the way I think about it, and John mentioned it, you know, there's kind of a cooling off in a certain way now that will naturally occur because uh, majorities are so slim. Uh, nobody had the majorities been as anticipated. I think there would have been a, a quite a rush to move legislation next year, which some of which is needed and some of it may not be, but it's always good to s pause a little bit, I think, and think about this and particularly so with like kind exchanges or some of the other issues that you mentioned that are so important. You didn't talk I don't believe about restructuring debt, but that's another issue that obviously we are uh, we are very uh, deep into to make sure that people don't get hit too much. And uh, FERPTA, uh, in terms of perhaps if there's an infrastructure bill, maybe FERPTA and the uh, facilitating public-private partnerships can we pushed on that. So let's move to uh, Chip Rogers. Chip and I worked closely 20 years ago on. Uh, TRIA after 9-11 to establish the Terrorism Risk Insurance uh, Act. And we moved quickly because uh, people had this kind of coverage before 9-11, 9-11 happened. And all of a sudden, uh, the direct insurers would not offer it because the reinsurance industry would no longer reinsure that product. And so nationwide in certain markets nationwide, and for certainly for certain asset classes, you could not get financing and 
transactions were stalled or delayed. Now we have a situation where there was no real insurance under the force, force majeure uh, provisions for a pandemic, but here we're coming out of it and we're beginning to be concerned that there might be a need for this. So we've got a strong coalition that's organized and CHIP is our point, uh, point person on this. CHIP, what's happening on this uh, issue area? Thank you, Jeff. Um, we've been very busy putting together, as many of you may have seen, the announcement on our business uh, continuity coalition, which uh, just was rolled out last week. And um, we have, a, as Jeff mentioned, a very strong coalition here from a broad range of uh, participants in the, you know, major elements of the GDP, everything from the entertainment to network uh, news, uh, real estate, etc. Uh, Walt Disney. Uh, so it's a, uh, we have a website, which is, you can just Google, it's a uh, uh, pandemic or uh, business continuity coalition.org. Uh, the, the, as Jeff mentioned, the, the COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the deficiencies in, uh, uh, in, in the pandemic risk coverage. Most people's business uh, uh, interruption or business continuity insurance was, was uh, found that the policies were useless uh, in the current crisis. Insurers are uh, reluctant to offer any kind of coverage there. Uh, and so we began in March to really look at how to, uh, uh, you know, how do we address this problem and, and advance a, a rational proposal. So we've been using the formula that we developed during TRIA of working closely with the policyholder community, with risk managers from a lot of our member organizations, uh, talking to underwriters from the insurers, uh, reaching out to all the key stakeholders, as well as uh, various different political elements. And we're close to, I think, getting to bill language now, legislative text to advance a product, uh, uh, you know, among policymakers. There's a hearing on November 19th among the House subcommittee on insurance, uh, part of the House Financial Services Committee, and we will have a witness testifying at, at that hearing. Uh, and we expect to be able to to move something uh, forward there. There's been a few legislative proposals put forward. Uh, Caroline Maloney has the Pandemic Risk Insurance Act of 2020, and we've been working constructively with her staff uh, to try to adapt that bill to, to our needs and, and to make it more uh, feasible. Uh, and, and we're also looking at a number of other models, including TRIA, the uh, Wartime Damages Corporation from World War II, the Crop Insurance Program, and other successful models out there that we think can be adapted uh, to um, basically create a new model for any kind of federal-backed insurance, but it would be, this would be a real pioneering effort uh, with this. And the idea would be to try to create a, a, a level of insurance that would protect the economy going into another major shutdown. Uh, and uh, uh, so stay tuned. I think it's probably not a lame duck. Uh, it won't probably advance during lame duck uh, to fruition, but uh, we'll, we'll probably be uh, maybe a first quarter effort next year uh, with the new administration uh, and, uh, and new Congress. Um, the the um, leadership in the House uh, Will, it is expected to remain the same in the Financial Services Committee with Maxine Waters, uh, chair of the committee, ranking member Patrick McHenry. Um, and uh, on the Senate side, um, Senator Crapo, who currently chairs the Senate Banking Committee, will rotate over to uh, chair of the Finance Committee, in theory, or be ranking member. And Pat, Pat Toomey from Pennsylvania would advance to uh, either be chair or ranking member, and Sherrod Brown would be ranking member or chair from yeah. Ohio. Hey, so Chip, um, this is going to be quite a um, quite an effort, quite an undertaking, and the key thing here will be that we need to establish that there is a market failure, that in fact there are transactions that will demand some sort of uh, protection against a future pandemic, whether that's in lease agreements or construction, construction agreements or refinancing. And then if there is a demand in the marketplace for this product, 
we need to be able to show that the private industry, that being the insurance industry, can't provide the product. And that's how we got TRIA done, and it's right. how we're going to have to. So please share your data with us, uh, people, as uh, Dwayne called our Roundtable Nation, I think. So please let us know uh, we need the facts and so forth. And with that, I believe that let's suspend on these, uh, these uh, more detail questions for a few minutes, because I think that Senator Bennett um, uh, has joined us. And while we, uh, while we maybe get uh, the Senator in, I'll just give a quick background here while he, while he's, uh, I think we're hooking him in. Uh, I think everybody knows Senator Bennett. Um, he's represented Colorado in the United States Senate since um, 2009. Um, pragmatic, independent thinker. Um, he's been to our meetings many times and engaged us on things that we agree with and things that we don't agree with, but it's always a very open door on all issues. Before being uh, elected to the Senate, uh, he uh, worked in the private industry to restore uh, businesses that needed uh, help getting back on their feet. Uh, he was the superintendent to the Denver public school system um, and, uh, and just a terrific uh, United States Senator uh, Senator, uh, we're glad to have you uh, with us today. And um, uh, although I don't see you, but I gather that you're here. Are you here? Can you, can you hear me, Jeff? Oh, there you are. Yeah, I'm here. Oh. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Thank Senator, you. I bring you uh, greetings from uh, a few roundtable members in Colorado. Let's see, Terry Considine, Jimmy Miller, Larry Mizell, Bob Nichols, Eric Resnick, Mike Shannon, Tom Toomey, Willie Walker, and probably many more that I've forgotten, but you have a lot of roundtable uh, uh, friends, supporters, citizens in your state, and then, of course, so many friends around the country from us. And, um, and uh, I, I, one last thing, you, you know, we work in coalition, and, and obviously you try to build coalitions, and we build them with other real estate trade groups, uh, other business groups, and we have a great lobbying team, Missy Edwards and Dave Bockerney and Marty DePoy, and of course, from Denver, uh, Norm uh, Brownstein and his firm, and we appreciate all of them, and, and thank you for joining us. We're trying to make heads or tails out of this situation, sir. Well, so am I, Jeff. Th th I appreciate your having me. They, they've started our first vote back from the recess, so I'm going to be relatively brief, but happy to also take a couple questions before I get out of, get out of here. Um, Jeff, thanks for doing such an outstanding job uh, with the roundtable, and uh, and and w I love your members in Colorado. And Willie Walker, who, whom I've known for eight million years, is the most recent one to move to Colorado. So I say to all your membership, we're always happy to take anybody who'd like to transport themselves and their families to the Rocky Mountains. Um, I'm pr really proud of of co what Colorado did in this election. We had a historically high turnout for our state, ran a perfectly smooth election as we have done before with all mail-in ballots. Unlike many other states, we actually count our ballots as they come in so that uh, when, uh, when the vote is called at seven o'clock on election day, a half an hour later, you get to know who we voted for as president and, uh, and, and in our case in the Senate. That's, I would commend any other state to, to take a look at that system in Colorado. I think you guys are going to like John Hickenlooper, who's my new colleague in the Senate from Colorado. As Jeff knows, he got his start in, in as a, uh, a group, the first brew pub. Uh, he was in the oil and gas industry. Then he was uh, founded the first. Well, by, by the way, you don't need to connect me to the brew pub like that. I mean, well, I was going to connect you to the real estate part, but you just okay. outed yourself. But he, he uh, the first brew pub in between, I think, Chicago and, and California, but he became, had his own little mini real estate empire in the city of Denver and was uh, critical to the uh, creation of uh, our new ballpark and, and our fast tracks throughout the, the city when he was mayor. A guy who served the state very well as governor and uh, and I think it's going to be an excellent senator, somebody you, you guys are going to like to work with. The Democrats also did well in Colorado throughout from the county commissions uh, all the way up to the Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's substantial uh, margin. Obviously, when it comes to broader election results across America, 
at the presidential level on down the ballot, Jeff, I'd say one thing is clear, which is our country remains deeply divided and divided in a way that, that isn't helping us address many of the challenges that we're facing with durable and predictable solutions. And this democracy needs to do better than that. You know, I, I keep telling people that I see on the campaign trail and elsewhere that people should remember as they're listening to their cable television at night that we were not meant to agree on everything. I don't get up in the morning thinking people are going to agree with me. I get up thinking that people are going to disagree with me. It, it makes my day less painful, I think, making that assumption. And I think when the founders created this country, th th their assumption was that we would not agree because we didn't have a king or a tyrant to tell us what to think, but that we were going to take the disagreements that we would have in a, in a Republican form of government, and we'd use those disagreements to create more durable and more imaginative solutions than any king or tyrant could come up with on their own. I mean, even the real estate roundtable doesn't agree on everything all the time. And the debate that you have internally about what, you know, what policies to support or what policies to prioritize um, is, is a reflection of the kind of pluralism that we're supposed to engage in. And hopefully, now that the election is behind us, we can do some good bipartisan work to pass a COVID package that should have passed months ago. You know, and I think it's pretty obvious, at least from Colorado, what the contours of a bipartisan package to COVID should look like. Again, no monopoly on wisdom, but here are some thoughts. First, we need to ramp up our public health capacity to expand testing, contact tracing, and other near-term efforts to curb the virus, as well as to deploy the vaccine when it's available. Our existing public health infrastructure is not up to the task. Uh, is it an opportunity for Washington to do some work as an emergency to get us up to that task? You know, we should stop having a debate about whether we're prioritizing the economy or addressing the pandemic as if those things are in conflict with each other. We're not going to get our economy back to anywhere near normal without addressing the pandemic. Other countries have shown that's possible, and it's time for us to do the same. Second, we need to provide direct and substantial assistance to people and families who, has, who have suffered the most. In my view, that includes some combination of reinstating and expanded unemployment benefit, expanding food assistance, and expanded child tax credit, earned income tax credit, and rental assistance to prevent evictions. That's not only important for families to stay afloat, but, but to avoid huge hits to growth and incomes that are going to have long-lasting effects on, the, on our broader consumer-based economy. Third, you know, I continue to believe that our state and local governments um, need help to maintain essential services. And if they start laying off firefighters and police officers and teachers, that that's going to have a terrible impact on, on our economic growth getting out of this thing. Obviously, Mitch McConnell has a different point of view, but maybe we can find a way through by, in a bipartisan way. And last, and, and I do want to say how much I appreciate, Jeff, your support of this, the Real Estate Roundtable support of this. We need to provide more support to our hardest hit small and mid-sized families. On that front, as some of you know, I've been working with May with Senator Todd Young of Indiana, a Republican, to build support for our Restart Act. We now have 57 Senate co-sponsors, Democrats and Republicans. Lady Gaga has endorsed this bill. Clint Eastwood has endorsed this bill, who believe that is the support of small businesses need to stay afloat through the end of the year and into 20. 21. You know this because a lot of these folks are your tenants, but here are the numbers. Half of America's workforce works for a small business, and as many a quarter of small businesses are at risk of failure. Two and three don't have enough cash for three months of expenses. Half say it will take more than six months to fully recover, or they fear they'll never recover. That's true for our hardest hit businesses, our restaurants, breweries, salons, hotels, gyms, concert venues, movie theaters and seasonal sectors like tourism. And unless we do something, there are gonna be a lot more of them that close their doors and never reopen, turning millions of temporary job losses into permanent ones. And as all of you know, even businesses who are still operating often are struggling to pay their rent right now, which risks serious disruptions in the commercial real estate sector as well. So I think the Restart Act uh, is a great uh, 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 policy um, suggestion, proposal, 
And I hope that it will be part of what we do as another package. We, we are at a moment where we have to decide whether we're going to allow our political system to create more self-inflicted wounds or whether we're going to use it to get us out of, out of where we are. I know Leader McConnell and Speaker Pelosi have each expressed a desire to get back to the negotiating table, and I hope we can put the politics aside after this election since we're now done and work in the coming weeks to deliver a package that meets the needs that are clearly still out there. So appreciate your support of Restart. I'm very grateful for that. And let me stop there. They're waving at me because the, Jeff, do you have a question or anything or are you gonna release? I, would, I guess I would just say thank you, number one. And number two, I hope that the election results will actually enable people to come together and work together and, and, and will act as, not, as, a, as a magnet as opposed to a detractor because I think it could have gone the other way and could, there could be a lot of action in the heat of the moment that might not be the best, but that's just my opinion and I, I, I don't know if you agree or don't agree. The I, other I, do, I do agree I, I, and I think that, look, we've, we've I really believe that the American people uh, want us to find a way to work together. Uh, and that the, the question for leadership at this moment should not be how uh, hard you can beat your own chest, but whether you can actually get anything done and produce for the American people at a moment when we're facing an unprecedented you know, uh, economic downturn in a global pandemic. And I, I would have thought we could have figured out how to do that during the Great Recession. We didn't really then, but maybe now we can. And we, we've got divided government. And, um, and I think the American people are going to be on the lookout for people who can't work with the other side. Uh, and, and that might incentivize folks to actually- well, we, 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 we want to be a positive voice. You mentioned the vaccine and testing and state and local assistance and things that you know, are good for overall the community and, and the country. And we want to be su supportive of that. And the one thing that uh, someone did email me a question and that concerns the no label problem solvers group that I know John Cornyn is involved in and I'm just not sure if you are and I'm not pushing you on it other than to say that these, these groups have looked at a lot of different issues, bipartisan, it's equally weighted Republicans and Democrats, members of the house primarily, but it's just something that there's been a lot of vetting on this middle ground on some things and suggests that if you're not aware of them, take a look at them and okay. they, they're pretty good. Good. Group. I, I appreciate that. I mean, I think that the fact that we've got 57 co-sponsors on restart, half Democrats, half Republicans yes, sir. testifies to the fact that there's a desire to get this stuff done and it's not... The rank and file, I think, wants to get stuff done. Leadership has a harder time getting stuff done because you know people are more interested in scoring political points. And yeah. I, I think we should see whether this new electric, this new configuration, gives us an opportunity. Yes, yeah. well, I know you've I got to run and go. Jeff, but I have to go. Thank you all for your uh, Thank friendship. Thank you, Senator. Forward to seeing you. Hey, De hey, Deborah, how are you? Nice to We're see really you. happy to I have didn't you. Get to Deb, Deb Cafaro, our current chair. John Fish, our incoming chair. Right. And Roundtable Nation out there listening to you. So thank you for your time. Thanks, everybody. I really thank appreciate you, it. See you. Thank okay. you. Um, I, I guess now uh, let's go back. Chip, was there anything else? I think, by the way, uh, Senator Bennett, you know, it's still sinking into a lot of people how the expectations of how the election was going to go and therefore the expectations about certain policies and policy action and focus and so forth is still really kind of reverberating through uh, people. But uh, clearly he's someone who wants to work across the aisle and, and, and we want to support, support that. Chip, was there any other thing on pandemic risk insurance? That well, yeah, you, you, you touched on it, Jeff, and I think it's important, you know, when we started uh, uh, sort of doing our research on TRIA way back in 2001, um, you know, it became clear pretty quickly that financing wasn't going forward. Buildings weren't moving forward because nobody could get terrorism risk coverage. It was carved out. And, in, and we're already starting to see anecdotal evidence of leases that are requiring carve outs for, uh, you know, another shutdown to get re rent abatements for tenants um, uh, that, uh, you know, in, in case of another shutdown. 
And so, and you can't insure that currently. Uh, so you can't insure against that. So I think, uh, and, and then we're concerned going forward that, that we're going to see uh, financing uh, requirements that, that would that would require some sort of pandemic risk coverage, even though it's not even in the marketplace. So I think, um, you know, we'll be searching for evidence and uh, of dislocation there and, and, uh, and, and trying to gather some, uh, you know, some, some data points uh, to support our argument. Um, and, and I think that's going to be very important going forward. Uh, we've got, you know, and we've, we're, we're hitting the hill, we're beginning to hit the hill more broadly on both sides of the aisle uh, to, you know, we want to make sure that this, this, this proposal uh, that we're still crafting is a bipartisan proposal and, it, and, and uh, you know, in our usual fashion uh, has bipartisan support. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a heavy lift. Uh, this has never been done before. And, uh, but I think we were successful with TRIA. I think we, we have a bigger challenge with this probably because uh, the exposure is, is much larger uh, because with TRIA, conceivably, you were limited to maybe one or two major acts uh, in theory. Um, uh, in, in this case, it would be as if everybody uh, had their car stolen on the same day and had to file a claim. Uh, you know, so this 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 is much bro broader. But I think it um, it would mitigate some of the uh, exposure that the government's taken on. Um, uh, with CARES Act and other uh, funding, uh, this would provide a cushion for the economy and uh, help meet payrolls, uh, help our tenants, uh, help hotels, you know, help all the troubled uh, real estate that's out there as well as the businesses that are in them. Um, we've also been doing a lot on, on you know, just trying to, uh, you know, address some of the uh, the physical problems out there uh, with our, through our Homeland Security Task Force and, and ISAC, the real estate ISAC. Um, if people are not on that distribution list, we'd be happy to put you on. We had a yeah. very good call. Let's, let's, let's uh, uh, I do think that's very important okay. and they're linked and a lot of folks don't know about our security task force. So I'm glad you brought that up, but let's go back to our leaders, Deb and John and, see if you want to delve into any of what you've heard so far a little more deeply. Did, did anything come up from Senator Bennett or from, from the staff that you guys would like to uh, probe? I just want to touch on two things that Senator Bennett said, uh, probably better than I can even repeat. And the first is that we cannot have an economic recovery without first dealing with the public health crisis that we have. And the vaccine is such an important, necessary step toward that. And I want to encourage all of the people listening to be extra vigilant right now about your own health and situation because there, the, the, the numbers are really real. And I hope I want all of you and your families to be safe. The second point I want to make is about why the Real Estate Roundtable might prioritize state and local government. Um, aid. And, and that is a, a somewhat controversial issue, as you know, and there's some moral hazard about uh, a perceived bailout of profligate um, uh, states and municipalities maybe who haven't uh, tightened their belt in the way maybe that we think they should have. And I think the two reasons, one of which was mentioned by Senator Bennett, but one is, first of all, these the cities have been the engines of economic growth. It's where our members have the most significant investments. And our members in the commercial real estate industry, as well as the banking ecosystem, really need to have a backdrop of functioning major cities in order to be successful and retain values. And then secondly, as Senator Bennett said, when we look back on the great financial crisis, um, the states and cities were contracting as we started to come out of uh, the Great Recession. And the, the states and cities hired 10% of the people in the U.S. And that knocked about half a percent to a percent off of GDP growth as we came out of the Great Financial Crisis. And so that is really just the background and rationale of why the roundtable might include state and local relief as part of its overall 
uh, priorities along with uh, liability protection, renters coverage, pandemic insurance, and the other points. So Jeff, others have live mics and I don't know if people John. want to ask questions. John, did you have anything that yeah, just, just, struck just you? A couple, a couple, I'd like to reiterate what, what Deb said. And, and I think it's important of uh, this, uh, obviously, unemployment insurance in taking care of yes. the people that are most affected yes. uh, by this virus, I think, is what has to be top of mind to all of us. And I think it, 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 it's good policy. Second thing I would say is that we think about coming back from this pandemic from an economic perspective. If we don't deal with the cities and towns and states and get them back on their feet, okay, it's impossible to have a strong economy. The private sector works well when the public sector is doing well. The public sector works well when the private sector is working well. We have to work in harmony. And I think when I look at Joe Biden, I look at Joe Biden's past 48 years in government, Joe Biden is not going to change his stripes after 48 years. And if I was a betting person, I would say Joe Biden is going to be in that office for four years. And therefore, he's going to be unhinged to do what he knows is best and what he's done in the past is bring people together, create a, a very workable democracy and have one America. I am extremely bullish on our prospects going forward. What I also would say is I think the real estate roundtable, fortunately, Jeff, because of you and your staff, is going to be at the absolute center of this conversation. And that's why I think this is a wonderful opportunity, like politics, like government, to come together, okay, put our thoughts on the table, and ensure we do everything that's in the best interest of both the country. And at the end of the day, that's going to emanate to us as a real estate sector. So, Jeff, that's my comments. Thank you. Thank, thank you both. Um, let's go back. I got a couple other uh, questions here that I think that, um, you know, uh, the one that I've received about five or six of is to you, Ryan. Uh, are 1031s going to be eliminated next year? That's a question for you to answer. Everyone's waiting for the answer. Ryan, are they gone? I don't think so. I mean, I think the risk has gone down. You certainly don't want to ever take anything for granted. Um, look, it was a Republican tax bill that put repeal of 1031 on the table a few years ago. So you know, it, it, there's, it's just an issue that most Americans don't aren't very knowledgeable about and so for that reason it's viewed i think as as, as a vulnerable provision and um uh, but no i'd say the if i had to put odds i'd put pretty low odds on repeal of uh, yeah and in that situation i mean it's the same it, this is like preparing for what we thought was going to be a very difficult tax reform discussion we did the work we did the analysis we showed uh, uh, for example on 1031s that um many of these transactions would not occur but for uh, 1031, I think there's a general view that these would all be taxable sales, which is not true. Uh, and uh, a number of other things that jobs and the lowering of debt on these assets and the ability to keep capital and reinvest in assets is very important. We've got all that data. We've got a great coalition uh, that will focus on, on that. Um, and then the other, uh, the other one is just capital gain in general. And there again, I think that, that it, it may be uh, not quite so quickly before members of Congress as we thought it was going to be, maybe hit the stall a little bit. Um, Dwayne, uh, do you want to talk at all about a, a, maybe just your thoughts on immigration for a second? Because you and I and we have worked on, and, and some of these issues, and it's sort of like state and local as you're talking about, Deb, you know, we have our primary real estate issues, then we have our bigger issues and that are not directly uh, related to us, but indirectly related to us, but all of them. And we continually try to make people aware of this. We're looking at the issues from the asset out. What can, what tax policy, what lending policy, what environmental policy, what security policies, what policies relating to that asset are gonna be done to make that asset be a sustainable growing asset over time. Not that it goes up and down, but over time. And, uh, and immigration is another one of those. It's very, very important to us, although, you know, direct, it's not a direct real estate thing. It affects everybody. Dwayne, immigration in the next Congress, how do you see that playing out, if at all? Um, yeah, sure, Jeff. Um, I, I'd offer that I think, at least initially, uh, the main play is going to be from the administration. Um, early on, um, I would imagine we'd see a lot of executive orders and rulemakings 
from the Biden-Harris administration to try to undo what it sees as some of the uh, more extreme policies, let's say, from, from the Trump-Pence administration. And these will focus, I would venture to guess, on some of the more humanitarian areas of immigration. They certainly have a jobs creation component to them as well uh, yeah. because of the large uh, you know, segment of the workforce that is, that is foreign born. But I think just the call from the base and the politics that will be driving the, po uh, the party, I think one of the first efforts we'll see from the administration, for example, is to reinstate the protections for the dreamers, um, the, the, the children who were brought to the United States by their parents um, uh, at, uh, as young children. Um, so we'll see reinstatement of dreamer protection. We'll see, see reinstatement of protections under the temporary protected status program. Um, these are some of the more humanitarian related issues with regard to immigrants from the uh, Northern Triangle in Latin America. And from the Real Estate Roundtable's perspective and the way that we have looked at these, um, these are certainly uh, key and important elements of, of our workforce, um, particularly in certain markets. Um, so much of the construction workforce um, depends on immigrant labor. Um, in terms of legislatively, uh, in terms of what we might expect to see from Congress, uh, I personally do not think that the prospects are too high for a massive comprehensive immigration reform package. I uh, but as the but as the majorities in each chamber have narrowed and have gotten closer, um, I don't think the prospects are as high as they were, for example, you know, back in 2012 when the Senate passed S-744, a comprehensive immigration package that addressed a whole bunch of immigration issues. Um, and it got through the Senate like a 75-25 margin. That was pretty big. The Senate's just a different animal right now than it was back in 2012. This does not mean we won't see tinkering around the edges. Um, there is, for example... Aside from the Restart Act, which Senator Bennett had mentioned, I think the other bill in the Senate that has the most bipartisan co-sponsorship is a bill to remove the per-country caps in the employment-based visa categories. Um, so that is certainly going to be an effort to try to draw, uh, draw in more foreign, uh, 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 foreign people into the country for both economic and humanitarian reasons. Um, so my prediction would be we'll see a lot of activity at the administrative level, um, not anticipating as much activity, although many bills will be introduced. But at the end of the day, not sure we can we'll, we'll see a massive comprehensive immigration reform bill through the, through the Congress. But I could be wrong. Yeah. Thank you, Wayne. Well, I did get a couple of and just political questions wrap up and then Deb, you and John, whatever you'd like to, to close with. But uh, I have, you know, we are active politically. Our political action committee supports Democrats and Republicans. And uh, uh, we had a pretty good record again this year. We're still going to sort out and we're still counting the ballots, as they say, but we, we won a lot more than we lost. And uh, our trailblazer effort that uh, John and Jeff Blau and, and Ross Perot and Rick Clark headed up for us was also very successful. And that was designed to help people that needed extra help and that we're in a strong position of, um, of understanding our issues. So we're very happy about that. I have received a few emails about what we're gonna be doing in this Georgia Senate race. And organizationally right now, uh, you know, we're kind of uh, thinking that through a little bit. I'm sure we'll eventually get in, but for those of you who would want to personally contribute, and by the way, the real estate industry made $332 million of personal contributions in the 2020 election cycle. Uh, that's the fourth largest, I believe, of any industry group. Um, so people are going to bet, and it's split, Republican, Democrat, and so forth. So if you're out there and you want to make a contribution, you feel so strongly you'd like to be involved in this, send me a, a note, an email, and I'll tell you how to, how to get in touch uh, with those the candidates that you want to support. It's very, very important. Voting will begin, by the way, in Georgia. Absentee ballots, I think, start December 14th. The actual election will be January 5th, and it will be a uh, quite something uh, quite something to watch. Uh, but if you'd like to be involved, please let us know. So, And I will also say thank you to everybody for, um, you know, your support of the organization. It's a difficult time for businesses and for people, and it's a difficult time for us uh, here to do what we're doing. Um, uh, and we appreciate your resources and your intellectual capital as well. So Madam Chair, I 
turn it back to you and invite people to email us and call us and we'll talk as much as you want. Yep. Well, Jeff, that's a perfect ending. And I really appreciate all of our members and our chair elect, John, joining us today, as well as the Real Estate Roundtable staff. I think we're ready for the new Congress and the new administration, whatever it may bring. And uh, we look forward to uh, yeah. in engaging with our members again soon. Jeff, thank you, uh, thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Thanks John. Jeff.